Uh, so we will go on with the with the presentation with the with the last third, uh, which will be about uh, about the design of uh, concrete walls or or well any other structures that are subjected like plate structures that are subjected to loads within its own plane. So you can use strat and tie models in also in uh, in slabs for with withstanding horizontal forces, for example. And uh, I'm going to talk first about the, the behavior of struts and, and ties, uh, then the behavior of nodes, and uh, then a bit about uh, different strategies for choosing uh, suitable strut and tie models, because there are even more possibilities in there than, than there were with the strip method. And uh, Basically, the and then in the end, I will I will show an example of a of a structure that uh, that I participated in designing uh, last year, where we had to use uh, design some walls with strut and tie models because of some quite uh, quite special challenges with with the project. Uh, so the strut and tie models uh, they. Historically, it's it's not a new thing at all. It's probably even older than than the flexural design of uh, of reinforced concrete. So already in 1899, uh, Ritter proposed uh, to look at a concrete beam as having a virtual truss in it and uh, and designing it to, like. Well, because back then people were used to designing steel trusses, so he proposed uh, that to, to design concrete with the same approach. Well, in his model, he actually, what he missed was the compression zone on top. He, so theoretically, it's, it's not a totally consistent approach, but um, already in 1908, uh, Mersch uh, was then the first one that actually proposed an approach to share design of beams, which is basically the same approach that, uh, that we are using, using now. With the strut and tie model that he, he found quite correctly, that the, you can calculate the forces in stirrups by considering an equilibrium of a, of a node like this, where you have an inclined compression field and uh, tensile reinforcement and you can calculate the, the required shear reinforcement just from the equilibrium of, uh, of this node. So already intuitively, it was, it was an approach that, that people used already back then, even though there was no theoretical basis for it yet. So the strut and tie models and, uh, and the stress fields, which is a more uh, physically correct approach, uh, but uh, we'll see that it's actually, for applications, it's, it's, uh, they're very similar. Uh, the, it's actually also based on the theory of plasticity. And uh, we, are, we are actually using, again, the lower bound uh, theorem of the theory of plasticity, that we are choosing a distribution of uh, forces inside the element that is statically admissible. And we are making sure that we have either enough concrete or enough steel to withstand these forces. Uh, so, so strut and tie models and stress fields, what's the difference between them? That in, in, in case of stress fields, as the, the thing in the bottom in here, we are uh, also consider we are considering that actually the strength, the stress of concrete in the compressive field, it doesn't have to be equal to Fc. It can be lower than that. So, so we consider that the whole width of a band like this is under even compression. And uh, the, so up, this is the strut and tie model that corresponds to the stress field below. Uh, but in certain tie models, we simplify, we can also simplify the, the placement of reinforcement, or that actually we are, we put, we also smear the shear reinforcement 
we don't put the only bars in where a bar would be in our strut and tie model, but we actually smear it uh, into a wider area because we've seen that it's actually provides better behavior than, than concentrating it. Like people used to concentrate shear reinforcement in historical structures, but then the more concentrated the nodes are, the, the more likely it is that there will be cracks or some other problems with the, with the behavior. <clears throat> so when do we need to use strut and tie models? Mm, Schleich uh, has published, it's an, it's an American Concrete Institute publication, uh, from 1987, it's a, it's a very good material about strut and time models. He defines, uh, uh, he distributes the structure into B regions or beam regions that uh, where the beam theory is applicable and D or discontinuity regions where the beam theory is not uh, directly applicable. So where we need to use uh, strut and tie models. So one way to define uh, what's a B region and what's a D region is look at the direction of elastic principal stresses. So these lines here show the principal stresses in, in, a, in a beam like that, that when the stresses are parallel, they don't change too fast. So all these lines are more or less parallel. Then the beam theory is, uh, is applicable. But when there are discontinuities in the, in the stress fields, like in here they are converging, then uh, in these cases it's, uh, it's not enough to use the beam theory, but we have to also basically consider what is happening in the, in the thickness of the cross-section. So where are the, where are the the D regions in structures, uh, well, like, and one approach is to say that it's we should consider strut and tie models or the, this kind of behavior in the around concentrated loads, like about the distance equal to the uh, depth of the of the structure. Then in the in the corners, the frame corners, then around corbels then uh, in the ends of columns, uh, then the footings, then the, where the, the depth of the, of the element changes, uh, when there are big openings inside, uh, inside the element. And uh, yes, then it's again the frame corners and, and, uh, and footings. So yeah, as I said, it's uh, it's actually a lower bound solution. Uh, it's we are choosing a stress field that doesn't violate the yield condition. That means the stresses remain below the yield strength of concrete, and uh, we are not concerned with the deformations. We don't look at the deformations because the theory, our material model is the material of, from theory of plasticity, it's rigid plastic. So if the stress is below or equal to the yield stress, then the deformation is zero. Like this assumption, it actually allows us to have this discontinuity lines in the, in the element. It's, it's okay for the theory, or by the theory, that uh, in this part of the element, we have uh, some stress in concrete, and in the corners there is no stress. And uh, there is no violation of anything at the limit, because the displacement is equally zero, whether there is a stress or when there is no stress. And also there is no, no violation at the border with the, with the, with the nodes that in, in this part there is stress in two directions, there is one direction, and it's also perfectly admissible. Then uh, there are different kinds of stress fields that we are mostly, by hand calculations, we are using rigid plastic stress fields. That, uh, as I said, the material behavior is rigid plastic. Mm. So in this case, our concrete behavior is like that. The strength is Fc effective, 
I'll say I told in the beginning that we have to, in the beginning of the first part, that uh, we must use effective concrete stress or concrete strength in this case, which is reduced, that it accounts for the brittleness of actual brittleness of concrete. Uh, then for steel, it's uh, we can use just the normal yield stress of steel, we assume equal, or we can assume equal behavior and tension and compression. Uh, mostly we need steel just for the, just for the tension part, the, the compression part, we can take it with concrete. Uh, then we might also need to consider the biaxial behavior of concrete, that uh, the cases where concrete is um, compressed or under compression in both directions. So in reality, the strength would increase slightly. Uh, it's like about 1.2 times FC, the, the, the capacity of concrete in case of uh, BXL compression. If they, like in walls, that the third direction is free because it's, it's not perfectly confined. It's not confined in all the directions, but it is in two directions. Uh, but uh, Normally, we we neglect this. So we even in the in the nodes where concrete is compressed in two directions or in both directions of the plane, even then we take the effective stress the same as for uniaxial case. Then uh, elastic plastic stress fields, which I will also show the results of. It's um, in, in there, we, take, we, we calculate the stresses in concrete with uh, assuming some linear or elastic behavior until yielding. So, so here, this one will be the same as for rigid plastic, but in the elastic phase, we'll consider the actual stiffness. So with elastic plastic stress fields, we cannot have the discontinuity lines. There, there it must be... Uh, there we might must respect the the compatibility conditions as well. And uh, in elastic plastic stress fields, one effect that we can also consider because we do calculate the deformations, uh, then we can consider the influence of uh, transverse tension uh, in a more correct manner. So we can use the the formula. Uh, of uh, Vecchia and Collins to, to reduce the concrete capacity when there is transverse tension present. And also for steel, then we can use elastic plastic approach that we can have, we can calculate the stress in, in uh, steel. And it's, it's valid. And well, uh, it's up to the yielding plateau when it doesn't increase anymore. So the elastic st plastic stress fields, it's obviously it's not a hand method anymore, that uh, there is a program that is actually a available online for, for everybody. You, you do have to register, but you will then get your, your password, you can log it in. It's uh, in uh, iconc or iconcrete.tpfl.ch. Uh, uh, it's, uh, we used it at TPFL for, for teaching purposes, but it's also, and, and well, for science as well, actually, but it's also applicable in, for designing real structures. Uh, I, I'll show you later that I, I used it for the walls that, uh, that uh, we worked on last year. Uh, and uh, it's, a, it's a Java applet, so it works in a browser. Apparently now it really works again because there were some problems with Java, or the security of Java, uh, before. <clears throat> and uh, it's, uh, it's, it's very simple to use for simple things, and that's why we used it with, with students. You can do then elastic stress field calculations and get all kinds of data from there that I'll show you later. Then uh, some differences, some like more explanations about differences between strut and tie models, rigid plastic stress fields, and uh, elastic plastic stress fields. That uh, if you look at a column like this, that is under a concentrated load in the, on the top, and uh, that is distributed in, into like uniformly dis distributed load in the bottom. If you look at the strut and tie model, 
and we decide, we choose as engineers to put the tie in here in order to achieve this uniform reaction in the bottom of the element. Uh, in the stratton tie model, we would look at the nodes and, well, we would have to anchor the reinforcement behind these nodes, but we could we could anchor it with a like, anchorage plate or something in here in, according to this stratton tie model. Whereas if we look at the stress field, we, we see that the stress field is actually, it's actually, there is, a, there is a small zone here that is under compression in both directions, but it's a, uh, it's a continuous approach. So, so we would see that we need to anchor the, the reinforcement at the edge. The force is not that large in here anymore, but we do need to anchor it at the edge. So uh, with rigid plastic stress fields, when, as the stress doesn't have to be equal to the concrete strength or the yield strength at the, like everywhere in the strut, we can also have uh, stress fields, uh, concrete stress fields, uh, compressive stress fields that uh, are uh, this, um, the, uh, like a, like a, trapezoidal shaped so that we have a higher stress on one side and lower stress on the other side. And uh, yeah, well, this, this basically is also, like if you put two of these together, we also get the, we will get the bottle shaped, bottle shaped truss that, uh, that uh, the Eurocode refers to. Uh, and yes, in this case, we, we would need to put some reinforcement in here. We'll, we'll get it because the, the angle of the of the forces or the stresses changes, and uh, whereas with elastic plastic stress fields, uh, we would consider the deformations, and we would get a more uh, like realistic or more varying uh, stress in uh, in reinforcement. So uh, if you now look at the the struts fields, then uh, their strength and then also the deformability in case of elastic plastic stress fields is uh, influenced by transverse uh, strains. So this is the general formula how the transverse strains uh, or the str general curve how transverse strains reduce the, the capacity. So in for practical use uh, we look at some sp specific cases to make it easier for for applications. So, if we have uh, only compression in one direction and uh, there is definitely no lateral uh, no lateral expansion or or there is lateral compression, then uh, we can take the strength of the strut as the FC effective. So then, then we would be somewhere in here. So now if we have uh, compression in one direction and then some cracks that are along this compression field or in the same direction as the compression field. So we have some tension in here that has caused the cracks. Uh, then we can use and yes, in this case, it's yeah, one point FCF. So in this case, we can uh, use a factor 0.8 FC effective. So this would be somewhere in here. So then when the, when the cracks are inclined compared to the compared to the compression direction of compression in the compression field, so when the reinforcement is at an angle, then the situation for concrete is actually markedly worse than, than in this case. Because uh, if we have a, if you have compression and cracks that are parallel to the compression, the reduction here is mostly because the cracks are not perfectly straight and they, they have slight inclinations and they, they vary a bit. So the effective width of the uncracked part is decreased. 
but now if the angles, if the cracks are at an angle with a compression field, then the only way to carry compression is through the cracks. So it has to be done through the aggregate interlock or through the unevenness of, of the crack clips. So in this case, uh, we have to reduce the, the effective strength by multiplying it with 0.6. So it would be 0.6 times Fc effective, the strength of the struts. And, uh, and now the, the last case would be when the reinforcement in lateral directions is yielding, then the cracks width, crack widths will start growing uh, pretty much uncontrollably. And also the, the transfer of aggregate interlock is uh, disturbed because in order to activate aggregate interlock, we also need to have a force that keeps the cracks together. So we, ne we also need, a, if the force is like, like this, that we try to transfer through the crack, if we don't have any confining force or anything that ties the lap crack clips together, then they will just open and, and it will reduce their, their capacity. So, uh, and if the reinforcement is yielding in here, then there is no force to hold it together anymore. So in this case, we would have to uh, multiply it with 0.4 times Fc effective. Mm. And now the, well, the last case, if, if the failure is really governed by an opening of one crack, then the, the theory of plasticity is not uh, directly apl applicable anymore. So then this, this would happen in, in cases like, like punching where, or one-way shear, where, where the failure is really controlled by opening of one crack. So what it means for the, for the strength of the struts, uh, or for the directions of the struts, so if we have a strut that has no, no. It's it's sure that there is no tension uh, uh, perpendicular to the strut. Then this this in this case we would use the full value of F C effective. Uh, if we have reinforcement, which is through the through the that is under tension and is perpendicular to the crack, we can use point eight. Now, actually, in most cases, we would have reinforcement that is not perpendicular to the crack, or actually we would have most likely uh, orthogonal reinforcement. And in this case, the, the cracks would be at an angle. <clears throat> so we would have to use the 0.6 Fc effective. And that's also, it's, it's also, well, in, in Eurocode, that's, that's where the new factor comes from, which is, which is also 0 0.6 times uh, 1 plus, uh, I, I think it was, you can correct me, but I think it was something like that, the formula. So basically, it, both, it considers both the effect of inclined cracks and this effect here is the difference between FC and FC effective, which the, the effectiveness factor is not to take into account the influence of cracks, but it's to take into account the increased brittleness of uh, higher strength concrete. And uh, then in, uh, in cases where you already have yielding of reinforcement, like this, this could happen at, uh, well, either, well, well in, if there is very high tension or large tensile strains, in the in the main reinforcement, like in a in the mid, middle support of a of a continuous beam or slab, when there is redistribution of reinforcement and this uh, redistribution of moments, and this reinforcement here can already yield, then uh, then we would have to use the 0.4 times Fc effective. And this also leads us to uh, one practical limitation that what could be the angle between the compression field and the tension cords, that uh, basically the lower the angle, if we want to use this tension cord to its maximum capacity, so we want to have F, uh, 
Geldinger still uh, still yield strength in this strut, then we would already weaken the strut, the compression strut, so much. If the angle is very small, that uh, we would have to reduce the strength of concrete. So the practical limitation is that the angle between compression strut and the tension tie should not be less than, uh, than about 25 degrees. Now, uh, with ties, it's, um, we can use, because it's, it's steel, it behaves in a plastic manner, uh, like actually, in reality, not, uh, we don't have to simplify it to, into a plastic material. Uh, we can use the normal design strength of, uh, of steel. Uh, then there could be some limitations uh, for the serviceability. Like uh, when we have uh, requirements for the crack opening, uh, then, uh, it, then we should, for a relevant load combination, uh, limit the stress in the reinforcement. So we don't need to do it actually in uh, exposure classes X0 and XC1. Uh, where and in cases where the the concrete is not visible, so there are no aesthetic requirements either, then there is actually no need to to limit the stress in uh, in reinforcement from the yeah it, it could be it it could be necessary for other purposes like for strengthening the struts but but in, for for rest, for the durability requirements, there is no need to reduce the stress, the, the, yeah, the allowable stress. But when we have uh, higher exposure classes, then uh, there are uh, higher requir requirements for the crack opening, so we should limit it to point, uh, point 0.3 millimeters. And then we can use the, the Eurocode formula, where the stress limit depends on the size of the reinforcement. So if we're using 60 millimeter bars, we should limit the stress to 240 megapascals, uh, which is, um, but but we should do it for the for the applicable load case. So we don't have to do it for the ultimate limit state, but for serviceability limit state. Then uh, for for ties, the main problem is anchoring the ties. So the the simplest way is just to anchor them with bond. So for bond, we can also make a plastic assumption that the bond stress is distributed evenly over the whole anchorage length. And uh, thus we can uh, anchor only the portion of the... On, only for the stress, we don't have to anchor it completely for the yield strength. But, but if we have put a bit more reinforcement in the tie, we can only anchor it for the, for the load that is... That is necessary, so re reduce the anchorage uh, length linearly. Then if we don't have enough space for anchoring the reinforcement that way, then uh, we can uh, use either anchorage plates that are then uh, welded onto the reinforcement. And in this case, we shouldn't, like a bad solution would be to weld it like this with the, with the tip, because here there is a uh, risk of laminar uh, failure of, uh, of steel, so it should be done by drilling a hole first into the into the plate and then welding it on on uh, on both sides. If you want to have the other end flat, you can also uh, weld it. Um, you can also just fill this with the welding material and put some welds in here. Or then uh, we can use the the forged heads, like with, like in shear reinforcement, they are at least in Estonia they are not that much that well used, but in in Switzerland they are quite common because there are so many factories that uh, produce this kind of forged uh, anchorage heads that you can just order reinforcement with a with a with a round anchorage head like that, but uh, they are much smaller than the anchorage plates would be because here we would basically need to have a well, we'll, we'll, we'll see later what, what the stress here should be. But in this case, it's definitely less 
the area, so the stress immediately under it would be more than it would be more than FC. So, so it uh, actually gives some. If if you make a strut and tie model of this, it will actually give some some lateral uh, compression, which we need to add a tie for. So then, in that case, there should be some some reinforcement that also goes around it to to anchor it better or to help. But like normally, we would have a reinforcement there anyway. <coughs> then about the notes, the uh, basically there are four kinds of nodes, like uh, either CCC or com that has compression on all the directions, then CCT or compression, compression tension with one tension bar, then uh, CTT with two tension elements, and uh, then TTT, which is the most problematic one, uh, where we have only tension bars. And uh, we'll, we'll see now how to, how to resolve these bars. So with CCC nodes, it's uh, if if possible, we could use pseudo hydrostatic nodes, which it's pseudo hydrostatic because it, it's actually in plane. So hydrostatic, in a correct sense, would be in three in three directions. But uh, it's it's in plane. But we saw that uh, we for in case of B axial compression, our failure criterion was that if we don't exceed FC effective uh, in either direction, then, uh, then we don't have a failure. So if we have equal compression on both sides, then in this node, we will have also equal compression on, in both directions. And uh, although, although actually Eurocode tells us to check the nodes, the nodes like this, the pseudo-hydrostatic nodes, uh, or all kinds of CCC nodes, they, they actually cannot be governing because the, the stresses in the nodes are always B-axial, so it's always rather stronger and definitely not weaker than, than the struts. So if you have three elements, then in this case, if this load here is larger than these ones, so the stress is the same in all the, in all the struts, then... Uh, uh, then the this node is still hydrostatic. So now there could be some cases when the when the stresses in different struts are different. Like if we have reinforcement in this direction, then here we would have to limit the stress in this strut to 0.6 FC effective. Whereas in here, well, we could choose a wider strut in here as well, but if we don't want to, then here we could have a stress up to, up to FC effective. So in this node, we don't have technically hydrostatic uh, stress states. Uh, so, well, the easiest way is to actually to, just to make this strut locally wider before, before the joint, and then look at the joint, look at the joint like this. That, that would be that would be hydrostatic again with uh, with then just lower stress. So for CCT nodes, when we have already tension element, then we have to consider uh, also consider anchorage questions. Uh, the easiest way is just to anchor the reinforcement behind the the node. So if we have enough anchorage length behind the node, then we'll have a compression in concrete here again, and basically it would again be a CCC node. Uh, the other way is to consider the, to anchor the reinforcement within a node. So in here we consider the lateral, the, the beneficial effect of lateral compression on the anchorage strength, so we can have a slightly lower. I think in, in Eurocode it gives a factor of 0.7 times LB if, if you have lateral compression. So in here, with this example, we can already anchor it within the, the strut. But uh, we, can, we can only do it if the strut itself is, is, is wide enough. 
So then this, the anchorage zone could be actually the governing uh, factor for choosing the width of the strut. And uh, we can also have CCT nodes with more distributed uh, re tension reinforcement. So we can use smaller bars here and reduce the anchorage length then, which is proportional to the, the diameter to the, of the bar. Uh, and then here also we would need slightly shorter anchorage length than when, when we distribute the, the reinforcement more. Mm. Now it's, it's also possible to use other methods to anchor, anchor it. So if we use the anchorage heads, then because of this lateral expansion that it's not perfectly anchored, we, we want to have, like in here, if we, if we want to have hydrostatic conditions inside the node, we should have uniform stress on the, at the edge of the node. So it cannot be anchored right behind the node. We need some distance to actually redistribute the compression to, to a wider area. So in here, we still need some, some distance behind the node. Whereas if, uh, if we are using the anchorage plates, we can choose the size of the plates uh, ourselves. We, and it's really important to have it as compact as possible, the node then uh, we should make sure that we have a thick enough plate right behind the node and it should be as large as the node itself to make sure that the compression is e equal. And the, the thickness of the plate it should also be sufficient that, uh, that we can have an equal distribution or equal stress, or even stress uh, behind the plate. And then one possibility that is used also quite often is to uh, like anchor it with its own plane by a, by a bent bar like this, that it just turns back in, within its own plane. Like this is the, the view from the top. And uh, in this case, what we need to consider or what determines the anchorage length is the bending radius in here that, that we should uh, check if we are not uh, crushing the concrete within the bending grid radius. And uh, for that, there, there are formulas in, in Eurocode and also in some other, in some other older, older guidelines or some countries' guidelines, there are uh, recommendations what should, uh, what should the bending radius be if, uh, if we want to have uh, use the whole capacity of the steel right before the bending. So then the CTT nodes uh, when we have two bars in, in tension, it's uh, one, one possibility is to approach it to the same way uh, as, as uh, CCT nodes, that's just to anchor the reinforcement behind, behind the node. The, uh, the downside is again that it requires lots of space, but uh, one nice thing about the CTT notes is that we can actually use the same rebar. We can uh, just bend the, the rebar and then uh, again we have to respect the, the radius or we have to choose the radius so that uh, it doesn't crush the concrete within the, within the bend. And uh, what, uh, what we also must have here is, the, is a bar that is uh, through the bend that it's also in Eurocode it's required to have a bar with the same diameter as as the bent bar that goes through the bend, which is, which is again actually to redistribute the, uh, f from the top, it's like this, it's to, it's to prevent uh, this expansion in here and uh, basically cracks like this and uh, due, due, due to compression right under the, right inside the bend. So TTT nodes, they are the most problematic ones because in here we would, uh, in here we would have, like we could, in theory, we could uh, turn it also into a uh, uh, hydrostatic node if you anchor all the, all the bars behind the node. <clears throat> but actually, if there is tension in all the directions, so the concrete strength, it, it, or decreases a lot already uh, in this area because of cracks in all the directions. So this kind of solution actually doesn't, uh, doesn't work. So the, 
basically the only way if you want to. If you really need to do a TTT node, uh, then you could do it by pre-stressing one of the bars to guarantee high enough compression and then bend the other one. But, uh, but it's, better to, it's better to avoid the TTT nodes when, when designing the, or when choosing the, the shape of the, of, of the stratton tie model or, or the transmission mechanisms. So now this takes us to the question of how to choose a good uh, model. Uh, basically, we're going to look at three approaches. One would be to get uh, inspired by the elastic distribution of stresses. Uh, then the other one would be to start with the simplest load transfer mechanisms that uh, we can come up with. And the third approach would be to uh, look at the places where we would anticipate cracking and uh, place this reinforcement and then, then use it as, uh, as, and the, as struts as well, or as ties to, to get the, to transfer the loads where we need them to be. So the first approach, uh, also historically, would be to get inspired by elastic stress fields. It, it's, it makes sense because it means, well, before cracking the, the wall, it, would work, it, it works in an elastic way. So the first cracks will appear where the elastic stress field, well, where the elastic tensile stresses are the highest. So if you have a depth end like this, then the highest tensile stresses are in this are in this corner. So the first crack would probably appear in here. And so a strut and tie model that we construct based on this, we would put first a tension tie in here. And then if you look at the, the stress field, then there is tension in here. So let's put another another tie in here. And uh, then the compression, it would need to be, there is compression in here and then definitely in, on top. So we would put compression in here. And then in this corner, if you change the direction of compression, so in here you would have tension, or root direction of tension, so in here you would have, um, you would have tension in this direction and tension in this direction, in this node. So in order to close the, the vector diagram and to, to find the equilibrium of the, of the node graphically, then we would need to have compression in here. So we would need to have another compression strut in here. So this would go in here. And uh, yes, actually we should then just go on with a with like a normal beam uh, strut and tie model. Uh, in this kind of solution, there could be problems with anchoring the tension reinforcement in here. So that means we would have compression. Mm, we have a compression field that comes from here and from here. And we would need to anchor the tension, the, the tension strut in the corner where we might not have enough space for that. So, so it could be it could be problematic. So it might not be the best solution because of that. Uh, then another problem that we could have with this kind of stress fields is uh, we could have TTT nodes. It's like this example with a with a column that is loaded with a with bending moment and normal force. If the bending moment is so high that we have tension in uh, at the connection with the, with, the, uh, with the pile cap. Yes, there is a pile, yeah, there are piles that are also, there is tension in this pile and compression in this pile. Then with elastic stress fields that are equal in compression and tension, we would have, we would have like a tension fan in here because for elastic calculation, there is no tension, no difference between tension and compression. So if compression is fanned out like this, then tension is also. So if we make a strut and tie uh, model based on this field, 
we would have all the tension tiles, all all the tension ties uh, joining in this node, which is very difficult to detail. And uh, it's also the stratton time models inspired by stress fields. They are not almost the most efficient ones for the point of view of uh, uh, reinforcement. So, like if you have, look at the wall like this. With elastic stress fields, we have tension in here, or compression in the in the middle. So we would get uh, if you draw the diagram of uh, horizontal stresses in here, we would have like half of the cross section in tension, half of the cross section in compression. So if you make a if you make a well, we put uh, reinforcement in the bottom in here, but uh, we see that the center of compression is somewhere in the middle, uh, whereas uh, if we did it, we, we could also like put the assume that the compression is just on top and uh, tension is in the bottom, we would have much larger lever arm, so we would need less reinforcement in the bottom if we used a certain time model like this, so it might not also be the most efficient. So. The other approach would be to look for simple load transfer mechanisms. So in this case, we would we will start by finding the support reactions from a global equilibrium. So in that case, if the load is in here, we can make a little. We can make a very simple. Stratton tie model, we don't pay attention to the geometry at first, where we have a tension tie in the bottom and, uh, and then reactions in here. So one good way to, to uh, calculate these forces is, is graphical methods like, uh, like Cremona diagram. I don't know if you have used it or learned, studied about it, but it's a, it's a good way to basically we are just making equilibrium of uh, forces we are finding we are drawing diagrams uh, for each node so we start with a node in here so here we have a force of f first we don't know the magnitudes of these two other forces but we do know their directions so we can draw a line that is parallel to this line and draw it into here and then we know this direction, we'll draw it in the other end of the, of the force F. And where they intersect, this actually gives us the, these both two forces. So this would be the force in S2, and uh, this would be the force in S1. So here we have the S2. Here we have the S1, here we have the S2. And now from here we go on to next node. So in this one, we already have the load S1, which has to be equal in this end of the strut and the other end of the strut. So this is already in here. And uh, now we know the direction of T1 and we know the direction of R1. So the direction of T1 is like this. The direction of R1, we draw it from the other end of this S1 is like this. So we can find, so the R1 will be in here and the T1 will be in here. So we have the equilibrium for, for this node. And this leaves us with just R2, where we can already see that we have already drawn the T1 in here and the S2 in here. So the only part left to complete this triangle is the R2 in here. So that's, that's how we can easily find the reactions in a completely graphical manner. And also, if you have uh, several loads, then we can, we can do the same thing uh, with, with more loads and, and find the, the model like that. And then, 
So we have tension in here. Now, obviously, we cannot put reinforcement through through the empty space, and also probably the the opening that is in here. The architects wouldn't be happy if we asked for a column in the middle of the of the opening. So we would need to divert the forces somehow. And uh, now, if we, if we have opening in the middle of our load path, like one way to divert it would be to put the tension tie in here and in here and treat it like a frame, basically. So it's, it's basically, it's like having, a, like having a frame like this around the, around the, the opening. So we'll, we'll have a tension tie in here. And it's like a frame corner. So then we'll have compression struts in here. And uh, and we would we wouldn't have this problem anymore. We wouldn't go through the opening with with our strut. Now, if we can get past the opening from both sides, then a more economical solution is just to put the tie in here. So we can divert the strut like that. Then, if uh, there is the width is restricted restricted for example that it's there is no space to put these bars or the, the tie that long then we can uh, we can put several bars and then also the the force in the strut will be smaller because basically this this load in the strut is defined by the force the for, the force in the tie is de defined by the force in the strut and the angle that the, the steeper the angle the larger the the force in the diagonal has to be to to incline it or to get the like if we, if we draw a diagram then if it's like this or in the other end this one then Then the tension will be will be higher the the steeper the angle. Then another way is to these these struts they don't necessarily need to be. Uh, we, we can we can make them cross each other like that, or then uh, we can also put them on both sides to make this. Deviations of the, the differences in the angles of this of the struts even smaller. So if uh, we use this approach, then the the other way to solve the same uh, depth end that we looked at before would be to put the tie in here and the tie in here instead of the one that we had before, like that, and like this we can. Uh, deviate the, the compression strut already in here, and then deviate it some more in here. Now in the bottom, in this node, we would need to turn the, the tie in here, and then we would have a compression in here that would then also anchor this reinforcement. We can either anchor this up to here, or we could turn it down like that, and. Uh, and use it to, to anchor this strut in here. So, in this case, in, in, in this way, we would, we would get a solution that is more easily doable, that the reinforcement is, is not at an angle, and uh, in here we also can have more space to, to anchor this, uh, this reinforcement. Now, for this, uh, the, the pile cap, uh, the other solution that avoids this uh, TTT node is to let this tie go further down, and then uh, let it. And then we we know this compression in here, and this compression in here, and this tension in here. So we will we will just anchor this one to here, divide it between these compressions. Then if we go up here, then we need to turn this one here and uh, again use this compression strut to, to have equilibrium in this node. And then for this deviation in here, 
we also need to have some tension in here in the in the bottom corner so this needs to be we need to have a tie in in this part as well now in this place this here uh, is not a ttt node anymore but there the reinforcement powers are just crossing each other so they they don't need to transfer forces from one part to another so this is this is not a problem to have bars cross each other Uh, then the third principle or thing that we should think about is the control of cracking. That, uh, for example, the simplest load way to transfer loads in a beam like this would be to just have a straight compression strut going straight from one load to another. But uh, because of the, actually it's because of the principle of saint -Venant, which says that the plane sections want to remain plane. We won't have a deformation field like this in the, in the element, that there is no stress in here or there is stress in here, or there, there is no strain in here or there is, there is strain in here. So actually the, the cross sections would turn like this, so the stresses would rather be like this, so there is, the, so cracks want to appear in the tension zone so for in up here this wants to crack and uh, and also the these corners they could they could just crack off so we would need to put a re or we could choose to put the reinforcement bar up here like this and then in the corners we would just turn it down like this and uh, and have a compression strut more in the middle like that. Now, if if you have a wall with an opening that is shown in the picture, then in here, if you don't consider cracking, if we just look at the simple simple way to to uh, to deviate or to to solve this problem of strut crossing the opening, we could put reinforcement only on one side. Then we would could deviate this force in here and have struts in here. Now, now this obviously would mean that uh, we would have cracks in, in these corners. So we, we would need to do it symmetrically on the other side as well. Now, in that case, if we, if we reinforce it with, with the reinforcement around the perimeter like that, the deformed shape of the, of the element would be something like that. And we see that we would have cracks appearing in the corners. So in here we would have cracks. So we would also need to put some reinforcement in here. And then the, the struts would be like that. So the, there is a small change. I didn't draw it very well, but there is a small change in each node. Now if you reinforce it like this, then the again, if the deformation is like that, then we see that we would have cracks in in this in these corners up here on the outside. So so that means that if we consider cracking, then the best way to reinforce it would be to put to combine these two models and put reinforcement on on both sides, and then assume that both mechanisms uh, carry only portion of the of the load. Because we can, we can, uh, so we would have a struts both in both ways. And also in here. Now, <clears throat> another example about the 
about the, the choosing strut and tie models uh, based on elastic stress fields. If we have a wall like this with an opening, the largest stresses are in here. So based on elastic stress fields, we would put a tie in here. Then we have some, some tension in the bottom here. We have some tension on top and here. Here it's a bit inclined. And, uh, and yeah, there is still some tension in here. Or we could also anchor it, take it just to the bottom. Just add something in here. So, and the compression fields, they seem to be there is large compression in here. And then the compression goes something like this. And here we can also, on this side, we can see this, this bottle-shaped strut, or that uh, the st strut, it could go straight, but according to elastic stress fields, or elastic calculations, it's, there, there is tension that appears perpendicular. It, it's also because of the same thing, that if you have an element that has force in the middle, and then this kind of stress field, where we only have compression strut in the middle, this is, um, from the point of view of cracking, it's, it's not going to work because, because, uh, because of the sum and principle, the stress wants to redistribute itself to the whole cross-section. That means we, we have to redistribute the load on both sides. So we have to have reinforcement that, that allows it to redistribute. So that's why if we have a if you have an element like this with a small loaded area, or like limited loaded area, then we should always have reinforcement in the top and bottom part, at least, so that we, we can distribute the load from here into a, wider, into a wider area. So in this case, it's put into two uh, ties that are perpendicular to the strut. Now, now the same example with simple load transfer, we could solve it totally differently. We see that here there is no problem at all. Here there is a problem with the opening. So the simplest way to get around this opening would be to put bars in here and in here. And we would just uh, draw a tie struts like that. And this would be the simplest way to redistribute the loads or to, to get the loads to the support. But then, in this case, we don't put any reinforcement at all in the bottom part. And if the element starts to deform, then we can see that we will have cracking in the corners, in the corner of the wall in here, and also in the corner in here. So that means against cracking, we should put some reinforcement in this part to, to hold the cracks together, and probably in here, and then, then in the bottom, and and also then on on top of the beam, or on top of the the window, and this way. And now, if you calculate this element with elastic plastic stress fields with with a program, uh, we can actually put the also the minimum reinforcement in that that we should have anyway, and uh, and then also take this into account. So we can already use the the reinforcement. Or basically, we can use the reinforcement that is there to control both cracking and minimum reinforcement. We can use it as the, the, as the needed reinforcement. So in, in that case, we can see that the compression strut, it deviates like more or less, uh, more or less uniformly, or it's just curved, because these rebars, they, they help to change the direction, each, each bar little by little. And also this reinforcement here, it it also takes care of the of the controlling the the expansion of this bottle strip shape strut in here. And then there is also some some part of strut that goes to the uh, goes to the load from this part, like up below the the window. Now uh, one practical detail that is uh, at least in Estonia, it's often done like this is uh, that if, if you want to have a roof terrace, you need to have some insulation on, uh, on top of the... Like in, if inside you would have just maybe some, some screed slab on top of the floor, then outside 
if the, here is then the window to the terrace outside you have to have insulation over the slab and then some terrace covering maybe some tiles or or whatever so that means we need to make a, like a step or lower part of the of the slab and this often happens to be in the middle of the span so we have moments in uh, in this uh, We have, a, we have a bending moment, it's, it's more or less at the maximum of point of bending moment. So how to, how to resolve this detail with, with shut and time models? Well, basically we know that we have tension in here, we have tension in here. We have compression in here, we have compression in here. So, so now this end is actually like a frame corner with an opening moment. So the if you have a frame corner where the moment is that way, we have element in tension in here and the tension in here. Then could we could we turn it directly like this? No, we cannot turn it like this because it would mean that in order to have equilibrium in this node, we would have to have a tensile strut in here, compression in here, and this this is a TTT node. So this is not a, this is not the workable solution. So this one we cannot do. So what we can do is that we can uh, extend this rebar to here, this rebar to here, and then use it to deviate the, the compression strut. So in here we can put this bar here, and here another bar, and then use it to deviate the, the compression strut. Now from this end, we'll have compression, we have tension, so this is a this is an frame corner with opening moment, or with closing moment, so we have tension on the outside, compression in here. So here instead of the TTT node, we'll have a CCT node, so this is much, this, this is okay to solve it like this. And, and this here we can do the, the simple CTT node by just bending the reinforcement to here. So in the bottom we can just bend the reinforcement like this. So we'll have a, we'll have a compression strut like that. Now the question is where to, how to anchor these reinforcements that uh, when, if you do a strut and time model you will see that it's, uh, that it's better to anchor this bar by turning it this way than this way because like this we can we can look at this component of this node or as a ctt node with a bent bar so if you anchor it to here then this strut is very well anchored because it's it's just supported by the bend of the reinforcement the same way for for that rain in here uh, we shouldn't uh, put it straight on to here, even if the if the heights happen to match, because we would anchor it to the compression strut, and in compression strut, <coughs> we would have a tendency for transverse expansion anyway. And then, if we put a rebar in it that is anchored, then the anchorage it's mostly by the ridges of the of the bar. This will cause also lateral expansion. So, so it's it's not efficient anchorage to let's just let it straight go here. So we should either turn it uh, turn it up or down. So it's probably easier from a practical point of view to to turn it up because uh, because then well if if you turn it down then it would have to be installed before the top part is cast. So so it's easier to turn it up. So basically, how, how we should reinforce this section is like this. It's, it's not really important to, to, make, to join these bars, because in this corner there is, there is uh, no force, so we don't necessarily have to, we can, we can end them in here. So, and another detail that comes up often in practice is, is corbels. So it's it's also easy in here that uh, we need to we'll have a 
first we need to look at the global equilibrium or where does it we are introducing a moment to the column that where does the moment go so if the moment goes to the bottom of the column like basically it's a model like this so what's the moment uh, diagram for this column so if the moment diagram is something like this the moment most of the moment goes to the bottom if it's on top part of the uh, on top, the corbel is on top part of the of the column so we'll have a bit of tension in here and compression in here so it's easy it's again it's easy to join the the struts and to draw a strut and tie or model like that Here it's the important detail here is the anchorage of this uh, of this compression strut. It can be either anchored here with a plate or uh, or it could be it could be bent down in here and then anchored behind the behind the bend or basically the uh, or use use it to to then support this or create compression in this compression field. Now, if the if we have two corbels on on both sides, then and the loads are not equal in them, then it's it's actually it's enough to put the bar in here, just a straight bar because uh, the compression struts will be then like that, and this will then create the uneven compression uh, and if we have tension in the cross section uh, or in the in the co column below then we can anchor it in here and we can have the we can you get the tension in here from the from the deviation of this compression strut So now I'm going to show you one uh, challenging project that we had where, where we used strut and tie models to solve them, to, to design some uh, reinforced concrete wall panels. So it's a, it's a cinema, there are three cinema rooms, uh, oh no, sorry, four cinema rooms in, uh, in here and they are on top of a supermarket. So. So below there is first there is parking on the ground, then there is a supermarket floor, and then there are these three cinema rooms. And the wall panels, the easiest part is the uh, the easiest part is the roof. The roof for for roof structure, we have like double T panels uh, in here that are supported on this wall, this wall. Sorry, not on this one. this wall in here and they're just just panels like this and then there are some hollow core panels for the for the ceiling of this these ones so these put quite a lot of load on these walls between the the cinema rooms then this part of the roof is actually covered by metal trusses that is supported on this wall now that's that's the simple part. If you look at the supports under the walls, then there is a there is a support in here for for every wall on the external wall on the external uh, yeah the, along the external wall you can support them there. Uh, then there is there are columns like a line of columns in here. Actually, here the support is in here, and there is a, a beam so that this wall is supported on a on a beam that transfers the load to the column. Then this front wall here, it's supported in here. Well, we can support it in a column in here. Then it, there is a support in here. Then this support here, the column is actually shifted a bit, so it's somewhere below this point. And then there is a support in here. And then last, this wall in here, it basically doesn't have any supports at all. It's uh, it's only supported on these walls 
that then are supported in here, and then they have columns that are also under, like along this axis in here. So basically, this axis is where we have supports, this axis, axis is where we have supports, and then there are a few more columns like along this wall. And uh, for some reason, the, the construction company decided that it uh, should be made of precast uh, wall elements. Original design asked for, for uh, cast in place walls, but, but they wanted to make it precast. And uh, the dimensions are that it's 13 meters between these supports and uh, yeah, then this, this part is about five, is five meters. Here, this is a bit more, this is three, a bit less, that's 3.4 meters. And uh, the height of a story, well, there is also actually an intermediate floor uh, that is then supported by this wall in here. And in front, there is an intermediate floor that is carried by, by, by this, the front walls. And uh, the story height for the first floor is five meters, and the other one is the second floor, like about this intermediate level. Uh, above this intermediate level is about four meters, or three and a half. And uh, the the limit for the element size was that it could be uh, 10.5 meters long and 4.2 meters tall. And the 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 span here is 13 meters. And uh, they, they really wanted us to dissolve it with concrete elements. Oh, the, the limitation on weight was also 20 tons. So uh, later it was reduced to 18 tons for some reason. But uh, we couldn't, like that means that we also cannot have panels that are 10.5 times 4.2 meters because it would be also be too heavy. And uh, so how, in the end, how we solved it was by solving it as a, as a Gerber beam, basically putting hinges wherever we could put hinges. So, so the front wall, so that's, that's this wall in here. So in here, they first had to install the wall panel on the crossing wall because this column is shifted back a bit. So first they put, installed this wall in here then on here they can support this panel in here that is then supported in two points or well, rather actually in top of here and then on this column and then you can install this panel that is then supported in here and then this corbel and then you can install this panel that is supported in here and actually because this would have been too long so we had to uh, produced the, the elements so that they had parts protruding in here and then they had to cast it in place together and then lift it in place. <laughs> but they, they still prefer doing it for that, that way for some reason. Uh, and then the crossing wall that has supports uh, in here, in here and in here. So this span is 13 meters and the maximum element length was 10.5 meters. So here we had to first install this part and then, uh, and then install this one. So these, these elements, uh, th then we designed them using stress, uh, using stress and time models. Like if you look at the forces that are applied on this element, then there is reaction from the element number two that is about more, a bit more than 1,000 kilonewtons and then there is load almost 2,000 kilonewtons from uh, the cross wall, which is basically this element, plus then this element and this element that, uh, that are both supported into here. Well, more four, three is mostly supported in here already. And plus there is load from above, from the, from the double T panels, from the roof and the, re the rest of the wall. Uh, so I, I made a strut and time model like this. So first, well, this end actually here doesn't do anything. It was just to make uh, just to make this panel lighter because this would have been too heavy. So I had to extend this one to here. And uh, you have a large force in here. So this will have to you will need to tie in here to to then deviate this strut or to, to deviate this strut. Then, uh, well, a simple solution actually I could. 
Okay, let me let me start with the, with the simplest model that I, that I could come up with. The simplest model would just be to put the tie in here, and then design it like this. I would need to put that. Uh, and then there is a bit of um, quite small because it's it's quite equal the force in here and in here, so the shear force in the middle will be al already a bit lower. But but basically it, it could be something like this. But uh, in that case, I would need a lot of reinforcement in here because the effective depth is only that much. And also the cracking in the top part of the of the slab of of the wall could be problematic. So I decided to put the main tie up here, and that that means that I need to get this force up here. So I need to hang it up with this one, and I would need to get this force in here up here as well. So I would need to hang it up with this one. So basically. Basically, this force, these struts in here all together, they, or th these ties in here all together, or this reinforcement, it has to carry all of this load. So this load is about 1,000, it was 1,045 kilonewtons. So this, the force in the tie would be equal to, to this force. In here, it's a bit easier because most of the load can actually go straight down to the support. So I don't need to take all the load up here, but, but just part of it. And also this force in here, I don't need to deviate it as much as I do in here, because here I have to go at 45 degrees, or about 45 degrees, to, to take this uh, compression field to the, to the to this tension tie. Uh, but in here it can be it can be a bit less, and then on top the top reinforcement this will be then basically calculated with the, with the lever lever arm like like that the amount of reinforcement in there. So yeah, I, I used uh, for vertical reinforcement I tried to use everywhere uh, diameter 16 bars, so that I can still bend them around the like anchor them with, with just bends on top. And for horizontal reinforcement, I used the diameter 20 bars that were anchored with a, with a plate in the end. So this is all, these are all anchored with a plate. And then the, the 60 millimeter bars there around them in here. The width of the elements was 250 millimeters, I think. Then the other end wall uh, that that is that is this wall in here. This wall uh, has a... Because it basically is supported only on these three walls that are crossing. So it's supported in here, in here, and in here. And uh, because this pen here is more than, than 10.5 meters, uh, I had to... I put the joints, basically, when, when I draw a moment diagram for, for this, then it would be something like that. So I put the joints where there is like zero moment. So I wouldn't have... I, I need this moment transfer in these joints. These are also like just bars left out and then con some concrete cast to join them. This one I only need to stabilize it in case the load is not, uh, is not uniform. But for the self-weight, it's actually... There are... You could put hinges, well, yeah, because of stability, you cannot put hinges in there, but if there were no problems with stability, you could put hinges in there. And uh, then the most challenging wall was, was this one that crosses that one in here. So this one has a support in here and a support in here, and then 2,700 kilonewtons from this wall that carries the intermediate floor plus the roof, plus the whole self-weight of this wall. That's the, that's the intermediate floor uh, and the, the roof is up here plus the self-weight of the whole wall. This is carried to here and uh, now if this was cast in place then I would uh, try to have the lever arm as high as possible. I would put the tie up in here 
and uh, the I would have compression like here this this is very small already this support reaction so actually most of the load goes straight to here and a lot of the load will go to here and uh, then part of the load I will have to also carry it up so so it would actually be like this something like that would be would be the strut and time model for that and then this would go and this would go to here well this is a bit too the angle is a bit too much, so I would rather do it something like this. This is anchored in here and there, then, then this will... Probably I would need to put some more ties in here to, to, get, the, to get the load up here. Now, because they wanted to make this wall of elements as well, I decided to split it into elements like this, so that uh, the compression strut that comes from here, I can mostly get it through these joints. Now, if I look at this panel in here, on top I let the, left the part that is cast in place so that they could put long rebars in here and have like this tension tie made cast in place and up. Uh, so, if I look at this element, the forces acting are about 2,700 kilometers in here, the reaction 3,400 kilo, 3, kilometers in here, and then the horizontal load from the top strut, and then the horizontal reaction, the compression in the bottom in here. So, I, make, I made an elastic uh, calculation for that element. I could see that there is tension in here, well, tension in here, so this can be done something like this. There is uh, tension in here. The compression strut comes like this. This compression strut comes like this. So the first approximation was to put reinforcement in here, in here. Yet there is tension in here. And uh, and yes, to, to put the reinforcement like this, I could see that I have really big problems with crushing of concrete in this region and in this region. Because basically, in order to get the load from here to here, I would need to take it down to here, carry it up, and then get it down here. So I decided to change the geometry of this wall. So to change this shape, like before it was, before it was that way, now I did it in that way, so that I can carry part of the load straight to here. And that's the, that's the elastic plastic stress field for that element. So I have a compression strut in here, but, but also part of the compression goes, goes straight to here. And then, part, then the rest of the compression goes through, it's carried up, and then it goes through here, through here, through here. And, uh, and the tension ties, they need to carry a bit less load up than, than they did in the, with the previous geometry. So, because to confine the concrete in here, I, I made a steel, I put a steel profile in it and uh, slabs or steel plates around it so that uh, concrete in this joint would be very well confined because the concrete stresses, they reached almost 20 megapascals. So, I used C4050 concrete for that, but uh, with the effectiveness factor, it would still be over the, the FC, uh, FC efficient um, limit. So that's why I, I put the steel plates in here to make sure that the, the stress is distributed evenly. And I anchored these rebars to this end plate to make sure that it's anchored well in the joint. So, so these, are, these are welded. I mean, these are welded in here. And uh, the load that comes through from the... Because from the, we see that it's 3,400 kilometers coming from here, but the reaction in here is 5,500. So it's about 2,000 kilonewtons that, uh, that come straight from here. So I put the steel plate in here and welded rebars that carry the compression. So in this uh, strut, I would only have the... Or in this node, uh, through concrete, I would only ha have the part that comes from, from, this, uh, from this wall. And here, for the vertical bars, I also had to use diameter 20 bars with a, that were anchored with a, with a steel plate in the end. So, yes, now we're already out of time, so now I can respond to some questions, if you have any. Uh, 
Hello. Hello. Uh, question was about serviceability limit state. Mm -hmm. You showed uh, how you calculate these um, uh, for hot limit limit state these panels, but do you use some kind of uh, stress concentration factor to reduce the cracks? Uh, basically, for these walls, because they are covered anyway, because it's it's a cinema wall, so it will have the concrete wall plus insulation plus three times uh, plasterboard on both sides, so you don't see them, and the 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 uh, environment exposure class is also x x zero because it's it's indoors. So so there, I didn't find it necessary to consider the any limitations on the crack width, because no one will ever see the the cracks in there. So what would be your recommendation if it's visible? If it's visible, then, well, then it's the Eurocode recommends 0.4 millimeters when you have visible, uh, when you have aesthetic cr criteria only for cracking. So then I would limit it uh, by this table. And uh, you also need to pay attention to choose the right geometry of the, of the stratton tie model. So you should consider the cracking. You shouldn't leave any part of the structure empty, pretty much, where you can expect some cracking. So basically, you would use stress concentration factor to... to yeah. Um, a question about uh, bottle shaped stress fields. Um, Eurocode uh, gives a formula for calculating uh, transverse tensile forces in a bottle shaped stress field. Mm -hmm. And uh, it also uh, uh, says that we need to limit the stress to the, to the lower bound uh, strength of the compression struts. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, there is no difference in Eurocode uh, between struts that uh, have uh, tension uh, reinforcement passing them perpendicularly or in, uh, in, at an angle. Yeah, basically they, they neglect the part when it's perpendicular. They always consider it as an, at an angle because, yeah, it's... But, but it, technically in, in like columns where it's definitely, you know the direction, you could use a higher value, but yeah, Eurocode at the moment doesn't doesn't account for that. But model code does, and the new euro code will be probably very similar, rather more similar to model code than the present euro code, so it's good to know it. Yeah, so, but the question uh, about this is, um, I, I have read that, uh, as I understand, the, the limitation comes from a test of a series of unreinforced uh, elements tested uh, until cracking load, and uh, th that is the limitation. So the question is, if you, uh, use this uh, lower limit of uh, compression struts for mm -hmm. design. Are you really required to tie, uh, to design, uh, really design a reinforcement for the transverse uh, tensile forces? Or is it okay that you really leave them as they are? Because well, well, most, well you, you should always have uh, distributed minimum reinforcement to use the theory of plasticity at all. So most likely it will be enough for that. It's, uh, it's, um, yeah, well, it, it's, it's a conservative approach that Eurocode has. It, it might ask for more reinforcement than is actually needed in there. So, but if you do reinforce it, can you actually use a higher strength for the, the, ah. this, this strut? Uh, I think you could, because, the, well, actually, the, well, if, if you calculate the transfer stresses more precisely, then you can... Sorry. Yeah, if you, if you can uh, show that the transfer strains are not high, then you could use the exact formula for the, for the transfer strains. And actually, in, even in Eurocode, there is a sentence that if you know better, you can, you can use better formula. So you can use the Vecchi and Collins formula and calculate the strains that are lateral strains, say that they cannot be higher than that, and then calculate your reduction factor, which probably will be quite close to one. So would these strains be, would you be able to calculate these strains from, if you like know the tr what is the transverse tensile uh, force, you provide reinforcement, yeah. you calculate the stress in the reinforcement, and, and, uh, and you could calculate the yeah. strains in this way. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Okay, thank you.
Yeah, once again about these walls that you were mm -hmm. showing us, uh, basically about the cracks, mm -hmm. the, the good thing that you didn't have to check them as uh, they were plaster walls and stuff yeah. like that, so it's not visible. But what about uh, stress limitations? Do you still check this 0 0.4 Eurocode recommended uh, concrete stress to not account for nonlinear creep and shrinkage? Or do you, do you account for non-linearities in creep and shrinkage if the stress exceeds this 0 0.4 limitation? Uh, I didn't check for the nonlinear creep and shrinkage because uh, the parts where the stress is so high are, are very small. So they won't have much very important behavior for the, or important influence on the overall behavior. It's basically just that the below the loading points where the stresses are so high. And I did have enough uh, distributed reinforcement everywhere. Well, the, the, these elements, the, the highly loaded elements, they had a uh, uh, reinforcement mesh of diameter 16 every 200 millimeters on both directions to make sure that, uh, that we do have enough distributed reinforcement for the bottle-shaped struts and uh, for, to make sure that we don't have too wide cracks anywhere. Because yeah, otherwise, there, there is the danger that you could, have a, you could make some assumptions. Uh, you, you make your stress field, but uh, if you actually have cracks elsewhere and they protrude to, the, to the, your struts, then they might reduce the stre strength of the struts. But for that, we have the distributed reinforcement. Thank you. There is a question in here. Oh, yes. Uh, I have a question about the connections between the elements. I can see that you have mm. left some steel plates there, but yeah. do you weld them together or, they are just, or do you just put the elements on and that's how they transfer the stress? Uh, we force? didn't weld it in between, so we have a we put the steel plate, it depended on the well we here we, we are using a, yeah, um, uh, how do you call it, an anchor plate, a PECO welder strong anchor plate, standard anchor yeah. plates, uh, and uh, we had a centering plate, like a steel, little steel plate, well, the, it depended on the, on the stresses, like they were narrower in case of smaller forces and bigger for, uh, for larger forces, and these were welded to the bottom plates, but these ones we didn't weld them, because actually in the ends here we have some, some bars joining the elements anyway. So this is, they are not considered to carry the load because they cannot carry all the force, but, but they are actually joined and there is concrete cast in between them. So I didn't find it necessary to, because there is no space to weld it either. And the bottom weld was just to fix it so that it doesn't, because the bottom weld was more so that I know exactly where the load is applied. Because especially in this case, actually here I left a bit bigger gap and uh, this one is not filled with mortar, but this is filled with some elastic material so that I make sure that the uh, that this is really supported in here and not in here. So I left a cap, gap of a few centimeters in there to make sure that it's actually not loaded in here. Uh, how have you solved the buckling problems of these walls? The, that's a good question, the buckling problem. It's uh, in the walls, um, the buckling coefficient, it shouldn't be added in addition to the cracking coefficient but it should be separate from the cracking question. So yes, if you have walls like that are that tall, you, do, you have to start thinking about buckling in here. And, uh, but the buckling, the effective length in buckling, in that case, it's not the diagonal length. Because the buckling will actually, it's fixed end up and in the bottom. So the buckling, effective buckling length would, would be this one. And uh, I didn't show the actually the most challenging walls for buckling problems. Uh, well, actually, you can see it in here. These joints here are because of buckling problems. Because otherwise, this we would have, uh, like, if, if you look at it, like in this direction, then we would have element in here, element, and element. So it's a mechanism. It's not. Uh, it's fixed in here. It's fixed in here. But in between here, it's not fixed. So if we don't consider that, well, we cannot transfer much moment in here. It's a mechanism in this way. But uh, when I join them in here, these top elements, then from top, it would be like this, the, the buckling length. 
So for these elements, actually, the buckling length is this length, because this is the, the well, that determines the deflection for the second order moments. And uh, I made the buckling uh, analysis, well, elastic buckling analysis with somewhat reduced moment of inertia to, to account for cracking. And then I used the moment magnifying method that you uh, multiply the, the second order moment will be the first order moment divided by one minus a vertical load divided by the critical load. So, so this is how I I considered for buckling for this, and it's it's actually the it gave quite similar result as I if I just had a buckling length like like that, because this is basically what it is the 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 shape, uh, the buckling shape is is like this so it's like a simple simple beam in this direction. A uh, bit different question uh, uh, in your practice. What do you prefer? Uh, Eurocode or uh, FIB model code, FIB recommendations? Well, I have both on my table. But <laughs> so uh, sometimes they are... Uh, well, if they are conflicting, then we should use Eurocode because the customers want us to use Eurocode. So uh, that's normally in the, in the design requirements that we have to design everything by, by Eurocode. And we can use other codes in case we don't find the answers from the Eurocode or in case we can justify that the Eurocode doesn't give the suitable answers for, for our problem. So it's first, firstly, yeah, Eurocode is much more born than the, than the model code on my table. Hi, just uh, going back to the shear forces and uh, punching, mm -hmm. one question. Uh, we know when we are calculating uh, punching, uh, we find uh, a perimeter which is uh, strong enough uh, for concrete uh, without shear uh, studs. Uh, uh, for the punching outside, you mean? Yeah, the outside yeah. perimeter. And uh, then we, we find, uh, I guess it's 1.5D uh, area which uh, which is smaller than yeah. that which we which we reinforce with the shear studs yeah um, do you know uh, good advice uh, what do we do in case of one direction uh, shear forces uh, especially in slabs maybe foundation slabs uh, because it's not uh, exactly written uh, as we know uh, at least in in euro code uh, is there uh, a distance uh, uh, back from the place where uh, where we don't need uh, shear shear reinforcement at all, or do we put shear reinforcement up to the to the edge of? Uh, of well, concrete? it can be. Uh, it the, I understand the question is about foundation slabs, uh, or or some heavily loaded. Uh, oh yeah, with the uniform slabs. load. Yeah, yeah. Well, then then the shear intensity of shear force will also, or the shear diagram will, will decrease. So uh, you will reach a point where shear reinforcement is not needed. So then, or the question is about the distance. Yes, the question is about 1.5D for, for, yeah, for punching, uh, which we don't have uh, for uh, one direction shear forces. I would, uh, I would rather use D than 1.5D because it's, it's basically that uh, the it's it's the last strut that is in concrete that can be still carried uh, by just the concrete only. So it depends on what we assume the angle to be of the of the of the last strut. Um, well, in the old times, uh, since we uh, when we didn't use Eurocode, we also used uh, this 45 degree yeah, principle. Yeah. So it should be. I would say it should be the 45 degree principle. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thanks. My question is about uh, applicability of stratum time model to uh, massive uh, structures, uh, for example, uh, bridge uh, pier uh, abutments uh, supported by pile group. Mm -hmm. uh, 
could you recommend some literature when this question is described, or is it make sense to calculate this abutment, bridge abutment with Stratton time models because of the direction of the force can vary. Mm -hmm. uh, so we have constant vertical force mm -hmm. downwards, but we can, uh, we, uh, we can have uh, lateral force uh, at least in two directions. Mm -hmm. And uh, there are also some examples uh, of structures where, for example, for um, Birthing dolphins and moving dolphins for the ship uh, birth, mm -hmm. where is a group of piles uh, uh, connected uh, by uh, capping uh, slab, mm -hmm. ma massive enough and thick enough, and there is no any vertical load, but there is a big horizontal loads. Mm -hmm. And uh, is it worth to analyze such type of structures with stratum type 3D models? I would say, but because this, uh, this uh, 3D frame, 3D truss, uh, is different in each direction, actually. Yeah, it's, it's true that it's, uh, we need to make a str different strut and tire model for every different uh, loading condition. Because uh, it's not, uh, it depends on, the, on the, where the loads are, that what, what, where the trusses are. We can do, uh, we, we can then make sure that we have enough reinforcement for each situation but we do need to do it different. So in case, for the case you have a high vertical load, you have a one, one truss and tie model, and when you have high horizontal load, then you have another tr uh, strut and tie model. So uh, it, yeah, it has to be different. And, but uh, about when, if it's worth to do the strut and tie analysis, then what, what is the alternative? Because it's, a, it's clearly a D region, it's not a beam. You cannot model it as a beam or a shell. Because exactly, this, exactly. Yeah, this wouldn't be right, so uh, it's definitely more correct to do a strut and tie analysis than mm -hmm. just to look at it as a, as a slab or as a, as a shell. Yes. So uh, then the alternative would be complete 3D analysis with, with brick elements, but this is so complicated that uh, and I, I don't think that it's... Uh, it's uh, you have to be very careful with that and you need to know a lot about finite element if you want to use 3D brick models. Mm -hmm. Okay, I will <laughs> think about it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Hello. Uh, yeah, here. Um, about the anchorages where you were showing the opening uh, moment in uh, slab uh, height change, level, elevation <laughs> change, uh, you showed the anchoring of rebars. Mm -hmm. Uh, from where would you calculate the required anchorage length? From the start of the strut or from behind of the strut? Like in hydrostatic you showed that you would yeah. calculate the length behind the mm, yeah. node. Yeah, you can actually also, you can combine these approaches actually. You could, uh, you could uh, anchor part of the load because we, we assume that the, that the bond strength is also plastic. So it means that we can anchor part of the load inside the strut that has lateral force, and then the rest of the load, we can anchor it behind the strut. Actually. And, and you would increase also the anchoring uh, bond stress inside, inside the strut? Yeah, you can increase it if you, uh -huh. if, you, if you need to. I mean, it's... Uh, it's a, it's a, well, it's a design approach, so you do it. If, if you really want to be precise, and well, there could be situations when it's important to, to actually make it, optimize it, or you, you might have some recesses in the slabs or something. But in, in here, like for that one, for example, I would, I would calculate it from here, and then here extend it as, as long as it needs to be.